the other thing you can do is also there's three if you go onto the window that she's in mm -hmm. next to the mute button there are three there are three um uh, dots if you click on the dots and just um put pin you'll actually then see luciana's image large just hopefully that that'll be useful for everyone yeah thanks nick <laughs> yeah normally when we do our zoom calls it kind of just goes straight in doesn't it yes it does absolutely well hello everyone and thanks nick um, i'm really pleased to be here finally involved in presenting at eva it's been quite a week as well i've been trying to be in two places at the same time um, the last two days bournemouth university also organized trust and telepresence which has been fantastic so i've been diving in between the two. Um, so I'm working with James and Marius from Play Labs and Nick from Ravensbourne and James I've known over 17 years, so seven years from Hackstock and Liverpool Psychedelic Festivals which we performed at um, and they invited me to bring my experience as a neurofeedback artist and researcher into their current project working with volumetric video capture and right now just as a soft beginning I am within the Connect4 image and the software Genie-Mo. And during my talk, I will show you a few different uh, layers and effects and things that I've introduced. So things have kind of changed a bit for everyone in the last year, and particularly uh, I can't touch people with neurofeedback equipment. So I became a kind of online streamed self. I adopted a persona called uh, VJ Token Girl, and I, I make videos improvise live for DJs in the electronic music scene now and in the last 15 months I've done over a hundred so I've actually been more busy than ever obviously not always paid but it's building up to another element in my career as a electronic artist I combine kind of elements of retro retro futurism hauntology and uh, remixing so cultural sampling that means I take scenes from really amazing videos and kind of you know, edit them in software such as VDMX, it could be Resolume, it could be Fugio. I'm not really, um, you know, advocating any particular one, but for live streams. Um, I got a bit obsessed about this uh, presence as well. I both feel nervousness and excitement when I do these events, just like a real in the club IRL kind of thing. And um, I always had to kind of tame down my ego there because what's that about? I don't want to feel um, nervous and counting the audience from my home. But um, I thought about it. I used this sub pack, which many of you are familiar with. And I thought that would be amazing if the sub pack could give me haptic feedback rather than me whilst trying to look at two screens, video editing live in the moment to get um, a sense of audience presence not like ping, ping, ping for every person that arrives, but some kind of frequency, some kind of sense of, yeah, being in a crowd rather than being alone at home, whilst we me wearing the sub pack I have on, on my back whilst I'm working in a particularly visual environment. So that's just something I can put out to you in case any of you have already done that or got some coding that obviously takes text and, you know, chat room into um, you know, vibrations. So there's, there's always this sense of risk crashed a few times you know and um what's at stake for me well the, the live stream might go down so um i mentioned just now that uh, i my work engages or i'm very influenced by ontology and uh, it kind of gives me a melancholia um it kind of came from mark fisher for me originally of course i traced this back to derrida in the 90s from specters of mark Marx. and um you know what we're looking at it's a situation of temporal an ontological disjunction in which presence is replaced by um, a deferred non-origin. And that was kind of my starting point for working with Jeannie Mo. So back in November, Marius and James lent me a PC and this Connect4 camera and gave me the software and regularly updated it and asked me to be their remote artist in residence, which is both fantastic, but also, you know, obviously being remote is what it is. The last show I'd seen in real life was Nan June Paik at the Tate Modern and uh, I'm very influenced by not just Good Morning Mr. Orwell, but you know, the whole global disco that he promotes and his uh, use of uh, technology. So if anyone doesn't quite remember that one from 1984, he sampled have live, sorry, John Cage performing with a feather, playing the needles of a dried cactus. I mean, how avant-garde is this? At the same time, mixing in Ness Cunningham dancing with a hologram of himself, 1984. 
Allen Ginsberg sang about meditation and disarmament. Um, uh, the, the, the beautiful cello player uh, was playing. Um, so I've got some visuals here at the moment. We have Superman, also from the 80s, but uh, this is when General Zod is being punished to uh, space forever for you know his bad role. I've got brainwaves I'll be bringing into the mix and why I find that we might have an improved sense of connection with the uh, presenter when they reveal something delicate and tangible about themselves. But let me tell you a little bit about the actual technical background. Sure, you've got the paper, but I'll just sort of whiz through it here. So currently I'm sat in front of um, a Mac M1 network with an Ethernet cable to the uh, PC, the NUC portable PC, really neat small machine. So the software Genie Mode permits a seamless mixing um, me media mixing playground, combining a computer's virtual camera with inputs like from Spout, WebRTC, and WebSocket network protocol. And I've been using different versions of this, and Marit has been adding different elements to it. This has also added agency to my work as an artist. He's added lighting effects to the actor, so within the Unity kind of environment, saveable, movable camera position, so you can kind of, you know, you can set up angles and you can explore and, and replay them and transitions. But I've always wanted to bring in my, my brainwave um, signal. It's very important to my work. Bringing in a level of feedback and the ecstatic consciousness into the mix is really vital. So um, right now, all of this is enabled. I'm actually connected hardwired to um, my fiber broadband router using a Cat8 Ethernet cable. I'm using the, a lot of free software. So I've got the free tool NewTek NDI, the Network Device Interface. Uh, video stream, and I'm sending layers from the main output of the OBS software, the Open Broadcasting System, on my Mac, which is also free. I'm using BDMX, which is not free, but it's a fantastic visual mixing, uh, you know, live kind of package. And all of that's being sent seamlessly into a spout being received on the PC, again from the NDI. And I've imported that into a context. So right now, what we're seeing is a combination of myself real time and my VDMX combined with shortly brainwaves. So um, I love this quote from Haig, the, the intersection of experimental art with still nearly experimental technology produces all the hitches, glitches, delays, and improvisations you'd expect. Good knows I've had a lot of those, you know, and that's what you do as a, you know, a, a live artist. So, it would be amazing to get involved in anything like a global disco, but here we go. I'm, I'm working on a kind of global consciousness disco. So initially, back in November, obviously that was pre-lockdown, I uh, conceived of a series of network installations, uh, maybe isolated locations like Brighton, London, myself in Hastings, St. Leonard's, but these restrictions kind of got in the way. I had to work alone. That's not so much a problem because we have a lot of virtual meetings and we all meet inside our own genie mode in the same meetings, which is great. We have at least three, four sets of the equipment. Um, so for me, actually, the, the biggest challenge was learning how to use a gaming mouse. I've got to just say that because I'm, I'm a massive Apple user and I wasn't really used to these kind of controls. Anyway, um, we, we, we got everything working and we did actually have some initial performances. So back in November, Hackstock, I think it might be Hackstock 7. I'm sure James will correct me when he comes in for the demo. And this is the first time Hackstock's taken place purely online. And Hackstock um, was an opportunity for me to show the real time brainwave context within uh, a symposium where we had obviously lots of different speakers and so on. And I, I just came in at the end to show a proof of concept, really, which was so exciting. Also, quite disturbing because I wasn't expecting how it was going to look. Um, and then in May this year, MozFest was obviously Mozilla uh, May 21. I implemented the latest functions, which is Genie Mo has a one click real time 4D social cast video communication and mixed digital media performance utility, which meant we could go straight into YouTube live stream, which we hadn't done before actually. And from there, I was able to, I had a rehearsal with a team in India for Mozfest in a day. And the music room was announced at 5 p.m. and a lot of the speakers had moved between different rooms. And um, I played cello, actually I played upright bass, 
live within a context of my own brainwaves. And if I remember to paste this link, I should be able to paste it now. I've just pasted a link there. Um, there's some short videos you can see of the real time experimentalness of this performing to people um, without any sense of audience or presence, which is really bizarre. Because obviously this is a massive nod for me, an homage to Charlotte Mormon, who was Pick's collaborator with the cello for many, many years. And I actually played the tune, This Is Your Life. Okay, so the theme tune uh, composed by Laurie Anderson. I mean, who doesn't remember that from the 70s? It had a sense of ominous, and presence and anyway I play it over and over again until I really get into it whilst my brain waves reflect the initial excitement or stress into a relaxed and hopefully more creative flow. Um, then after that I created Into the Rose Garden so I've always been thinking about this wonderful part the Burnt Norton section of the four quartet and how thinking about time really bothers me you know you can be excited and then you can get anxious and then ultimately the idea of eternity can be quite traumatic for me, if for me, brought up Catholic. And I think um, T.S. Eliot wrote this at a time where the Rose Garden for him might be analogous to his conversion to Christianity, possibly. It might be like a Garden of Eden. But for me, it's a multiverse and it's cyberspace. So into the Rose Garden is entering into, you know, the beginning. This is very much a work in progress. What will I discover? So here I'm combining a psychophysical stream of self-observation within my voxelated genie mode virtuality and I'm incorporating the brainwave monitor and the camera. So if you've seen my work before I always use frontal lobe. Um, decision making, relaxation and meditation are very well detected from here plus it's very easy and simple to apply because there's no hair. So by putting this on this is an IBBA, this, this is all in the paper. What I'm using, the software has its own bespoke software and hardware. Um, I'm able to add something now to my presence in this meeting by uh, revealing to you my brain waves. Now, without too much scientific discussion, a lot of spikes is often a lot of high electrical activity. And if I can calm down, or if I was to relax, or if my concentration completely just leaves this room, you will see a very calm, less kind of spiky kind of reading without going into any technicalities but i have worked as a neurofeedback practitioner so any questions i'll be really happy to answer if you would like to throw them to me um so this can capture my mood this can show obviously if i'm giving you my full attention right now for instance uh, i can also add in the context of, of the other kind of brainwave stuff so you get the other videos from bdms so right now we're seeing obviously a slightly calmer reading. Um, just move on. So my work has a cyberpunk aesthetic. Um, I've been doing this since the 90s, but of course my heroes are Alvin Lucia, whose work from the 60s with music and solo performer particularly was profoundly important to me. Um, you know, the apparent simplicity of that piece performed on a large stage with just eyes closing and eyes opening to change the reverberations. The simplicity belies a massive background complex system. And so many other artists, including Pierre Henry, Richard Pelican, David Rosenberg, using EEG. And someone I know, Mariko Mori, uses the same system as me. And I was lucky enough to experience that wave UFO in the Venice Biennale, I think it was 2005, where she has a giant holographic kind of spaceship and inside three people are linked up using the same hardware and affecting a Maya 3D kind of visual uh, experience within there. Also aesthetically, what I've really been obsessed with is test cards, test cards, because they have this element of waiting, you know, when something's not present. So of course that really connects me again to my hauntological kind of leanings. And uh, this particular test card I'm using, which has roses, is a French card uh, from ORTF channel from the 60s. And, um, I really resonate with this and T.S. Eliot's quotes from uh, Bert Norton, other echoes inhabit the garden, shall we follow? And I feel I am following, I've not defined this, this is not like, this is a set piece. I really appreciate comments on how to increase the connectivity of the audience in any artwork that's telematic, so it has to have risk, it has to have trust maybe, or does it, you know, your, what your thoughts are on that. And of course, uh, I'm influenced by some science fiction writers, so let's have some William Gibson. 
when the past is always with you, it may as well be present. And if it is present, it will be future as well. That's from Neuromancer. So I'll just kind of wrap up my kind of ideas because we have a conversation with Nick and then we're going to bring in Marius and James and show some great features within the software. Um, so obviously you're experiencing some occlusion, my edges, there's artifacts. I've got quite a bright LED light across the room from me. Um, at night, you know, obviously the contrast becomes stronger. You know, we can all play around with the light in our own space, but I, I got a cyber dysmorphobia at first. My face was very different shapes. My makeup even, I always a lot, wear a lot of um, eye makeup, but I found myself kind of like, a bit like a 1920s film actor, really layering it on to kind of, you know, come out in the voxels. And um, this camera can rotate 360, so, you know, you can unfortunately see yourself from every angle. And, you know, you have to learn to live with that. And of course, that's a great feature in the software as well. And I use that in some of the music performances. So really in the future, I'd like to be able to bring in effects like hologores as a way of using like a kind of point cloud filter to project things over the performer or the, the person that's in front of the camera. Um, I know that the team want their software to be device agnostic. So hopefully I'll be able to teach the students on the MA course using really cheap um, cameras next year, not the Connect 4, like much, the much older model maybe, and that will obviously democratise the accessibility to this wonderful software and other technologies. And uh, I'd like to quote Char Davis here, uh, of course a massive proponent, fantastic VR artist from many years ago, and increasingly the means of production and the means of delivery um, are being centralised and monetized. The profound potential that I believe in is at risk of being obliterated and uh, that was in 2017. And of course, it couldn't be even more pertinent now with Facebook and Oculus and all this kind of stuff. So it's very important to us as artists and developers and creators to not be owned or controlled in that way. And um, my paper has big shouts out to Paul Sermon and Ghislaine Bordington, whose work has influenced me you know, massively. And I was lucky enough to be tutored by Roy Ascot in the 90s. So I can't give a list, but um, it's, it's all there in the paper. So I need to develop my artwork more and appreciate any feedback and any connections that uh, your wealth of experience can offer me. And uh, Nick, if you'd like to join me again now, uh, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you for your time. Come right thank you so much uh, luciana i think what's been so good actually is that not only have uh, you reflected on the the nature the underlying nature of the technology but also as you've done so just sort of taken us through some of its its key features but also i think it's the way that that impacts the work that you do as well i think that um you know initially perhaps these systems were developed i'm not, not saying genie mode per se but the, you know the, the the push towards some sort of 3d um uh, you know, so, so, some sort of 3D telepresence was often aimed at fairly sort of mundane things like just conversations. Obviously, it's a it's an extension beyond Zoom. It's very good to see how it works in the Zoom um, uh, system. But I think also you're pointing to a much deeper and richer history to this, and also thinking of ways, as, as you said, that uh, it democratizes the production. You know, I mean, even the system with one camera and one PC, though the you know quite hardware intensive, is actually a lot smaller and simpler than the sort of things that were needed even uh, you know a decade ago or less so I mean Genie Mode does represent a significant step forward in that respect I think alone but also as you were saying now it's actually about moving on and and, and finding ways to deploy this and um, overcoming you know it, it, interesting you, you referred to the, the 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 fact of being able to see yourself in in, in all dimensions and suddenly sort of I've experienced this too actually just a sort of a, a realization of oneself in the round it's quite different to your sense sensation of how, how you are in, in, in your own head. So I think this has a lot of, um, you know, sort of implications and outcomes. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you've touched on all those things as, as, as we discussed. 